have our annual NED Tate Colloquium. It's a very important uh, piece in our department's life. And um, as a celebration of this, we bring in some fantastic uh, presenter. Uh, and we also put a little plaque on a board over by your own. Yeah. Uh, so, so we make, we try to make these visits as stimulating as possible by providing ample opportunities for everyone in the department and even outside of the department to interact with our, our visitor. It's uh, a little intense at times, uh, but that's fine. Uh, meeting in small groups, larger groups, individually and so forth, having a dinner, dinner, we're having a reception after this. And it's all part of this uh, wonderful opportunity. So, um, so this is colloquium named after Edward Tate. And I would be the first to admit that I knew very little about him. I never met him. I've never read much of him. So I figured it was fitting for me to know something as I was introducing this, right? Um, lo and behold, <laughs> well, I've, I've heard previous introductions of, of, of how marvelous and, and, and sort of groundbreaking he was, but I was uh, probably not prepared for the fascinating person that I found as I was digging through material and you know papers he'd written and so forth. So he was a Chicago native, for those who know, don't know that. Uh, moved around a lot, didn't find his ground until later in his school years, and all of a sudden he became this fabulous writer and pursued a, a journalism degree. Um, in the midst of that, was caught up by the war, uh, enlisted in the Air Force, was deployed to Europe, and all of a sudden discovered all the wonderful cultures and geography and everything about the, the countries he since moved around Europe a lot, and, and started to pay attention to geography. Um, before he was done with his Air Force career, they made him a, a meteorologist, that was part of his thing. Around. So from a, an excellent writer to a, a meteorologist with a physics degree, right? Uh, so pretty impressive. An interdisciplinary guy, and certainly sort of a renaissance man of sorts. And uh, some of the interesting things I found was how he sought these linkages between geography and public policy, interdisciplinarity um, amidst the quantitative aspects and also application sides of that. Um, at some point, he was recruited in his career to take over this department when it was uh, apparently in a downward slide. Um, so many, many people were offered the opportunity. <laughs> he was convinced to take it up. And apparently, I mean, did a really good job with the resources he was given to form the Ohio State Department of Geography the way we know it, really sort of took off, managed to recruit the right faculty, am I right, Kevin? Yeah, you are, oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was, I was not here right from the start. I was here from about two years. Mm -hmm. uh, two years yeah. if, if I could add something to what you're saying. So Ned Tate had a very large family, right? And he claimed that he had to take this position to pay for his family, to support his family. <laughs> OK. So, uh, one of the fascinating things was that he, although he really pushed the research agenda, he never sort of abandoned the idea of teaching excellence. So, it was always pushing faculty to really combine and nurture research, education, back and forth. That connection was super important. He did marvelous things with his students. He got them to read the news, took them to field camp, to interview people, and test geographic theories around the fireside chats afterwards. At least that's what I sort of imagined. Um, and pushed a lot of activities to, to really spread the quantitative analysis approach, but never saw it as a revolution, rather as an evolution, right? It was just part of what geography developed with, and didn't really never want to give up the other traditions. So a very sort of um, interdisciplinary Renaissance man. I was really, really amazed by his persona. He got AJ Honors Award for scholarship as well as uh, the National Council for Geographic Education Master Teacher Award. So really excelled in both areas. Um, the Colgan series is named after his, or as a recognition of his outstanding 
service as a chair from 62 to 74. And reflecting on all this, I find it very fitting today that we mark the Edward K. Colloquium series with a lecture today from anthropology professor Tanya Martin Lee. Um, and I will leave it soon to one of our graduate students, Chris Hartman, to provide more of an introduction. But first, I'm going to offer a little gift of appreciation for coming here, interacting with us, <laughs> and giving this talk. Alright, All right, my name is Chris Hartman, and I'm a PhD candidate here in Geography. And I'm speaking today on behalf of the Geography Graduate Organization. The purpose of the Geography Graduate Organization, or GGO as we refer to it, is to, quote, engage in scholarly, scholarly discussions and promote geographic scholarship throughout the Ohio State University and beyond, end quote. The GGO, along with faculty, put forth Dr. Tanya Murray Lee's name for this year's TAFE Colloquium, and we are very pleased to welcome her today. Professor Lee received her PhD in social anthropology from Cambridge. Her dissertation focused on urban, cultural, and economic change in Singapore, she then became interested in Indonesia by way of a postdoc position, and for the last 25 years, much of her research has been focused there. As she told us graduate students today at a roundtable lunch discussion, she continues to do fieldwork in Indonesia, um, as well as conduct research there with Indonesian and also international, other international colleagues as often as time permits. Her work is focused on the intersection of culture, economy, the environment, and also development. Her work is supported by several large, and I mean very large, grants from the Social Sciences uh, and Humanities Research Council, among other institutions. For the last decade, she has been designated a Canada Research Chair Tier 1 Professor, an honor reserved, quote, for outstanding researchers acknowledged by their peers as world leaders in their fields, end quote. In anthropology, and she works in, uh, she's in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Toronto. Professor Lee is the author of numerous academic articles and peer-reviewed journals. In addition, she is the author of four books, including The Will to Improve, Governmentality, Development, and the Practice of Politics, which we have read in this department. Her most recent book is Land's End, Capital, Capitalist Relations on an Indigenous Frontier. Her work is well cited, very well cited across the social sciences, and she is no, stra no stranger to many human geographers. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Tanya Murray. to be here. Anthropologists among the geographers. It's always a very interesting location, something from which I've benefited a lot in the last um, 10 years or so since this conversation has intensified. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today um, is this book that I that came out last year. And my aim in writing this book was to try to bring rural areas, rural lives, peripheral places, uh, back into view in my own discipline, anthropology, from which they had rather disappeared in recent decades. There's been a lot of interest in flows, migration, urbanization, etc., media, all of which are important. But at the end of the day, half the world's population still basically lives from agriculture in fairly muddy places. And I think that anthropologists have taken their eye off that kind of place and those kinds of people. I don't know if this is the same to quite the same extent in uh, Dorothy, but I suspect it might be. So one of my aims was to kind of refocus attention on the rural, on places where people are um, and trying to figure out what has been going on there. Um, secondly, a thing about the book is that it's based on 20 years of research. It's kind of an arc. I began this project on the postdoc in 1990 and continued going back uh, over the next 20 years. Uh, for a month or so, you know, I mean, in total I spent more than a year there, but over I think 11 years. And so what that, uh, very different from the classic, at least fieldwork project in anthropology, which is simply like a dissertation project of one year continuously, this gave me a, a quite a different perspective and a capacity to follow um, not just a snapshot in time, but to see processes as they unfolded over time. <coughs> And therefore, to be able to get closer to the, not only what happened, but the kind of how, you know, what were actually the processes and practices which were bringing transformation about, 
with the ability to, to, to see you know, at this stage what were people struggling over, what were they treating as banal, what were t to them uh, the big deal, the big agenda, or things which they took in their stride. And that kind of method, of course, you know, does uh, always expose us to surprises, and for me that's the wonderfully stimulating thing about fieldwork, right? Every time I would go back, I'd anticipated some things, but other things completely surprised me, and so that you always have more work to do to try to understand what's going on. And so um, what I found, what I'm going to describe, um, is a surprise from some points of view. Um, in particular, I think it works against some of the expectations and received narratives we have about peasants, about peripheral people, about indigenous people, and also about development trajectories and patterns of agrarian transition and what, you know, what we think is going on in these kinds of areas. So that's what I'm going to try to give you a sense of, like, what did I find? So this is very much a place-based ethnography. Um, so my title, Land's End, uh, plays on four meanings of Land's End. First of all, a change in land use. So in the place that I am talking about in Indonesia, the highlands of Sulawesi, um, there was a complete change in land use from shifting cultivation of rice, corn, cash, um, rice and corn as food crops, annual cash crops, like tobacco and shallots, etc., to one single global market crop, cocoa. And the change here was total. Cocoa squeezed out food production. There wasn't enough land for people both to maintain food and uh, cocoa production. The soil was too poor for them to intensify. And so for the reasons I'll explain more later, they were compelled to plant more and more of the higher value crop in the hope that they would have enough money to buy food. So this works against the assumption that peasants will always somehow be able to balance food, uh, but balance ecological risk and market risk, and we will be able to kind of stabilize the mixed farm. And raises the question, like, under what conditions can that kind of stability be produced, and under what conditions will it not actually emerge? So that's one of the questions. Secondly, um, land's end in the sense of the end of a customary land sharing system, as Highlanders, in my study, um, enclose their common land into individually owned plots and it very quickly became a commodity which was freely bought and sold and could be accumulated. So the result of this in the period of just two decades was a shift from a situation in which everyone had access to land, to grow food and cash crops, etc., to the emergence of what was really two classes, people, landowners and landless people. And for these people in 1990, that was an unthinkable condition. The idea that half the Highlanders would have no place at all to plant their corn or plant their cassava was just an unimaginable thing. And yet, that's exactly what happened. So there's a puzzle there, like, why so fast? How did this happen? What were they thinking when they closed their land? And why did the differentiation proceed so quickly? Thirdly, end of a land frontier, in the sense that the uh, forested uplands and interiors of Southeast Asia have remained relatively open until now as zones for expansion, both by indigenous people to accommodate the needs of a new generation. They could nibble away at the edge of the forest, and there was always a bit more land over the next hill and one after that. Um, indigenous people could do this, also land short migrants, and quite importantly, people from la uh, landless people from lowland areas could strike out from the hills, find a you know, clear patch of forest. This sort of safety valve function of the forest frontier has meant that across Southeast Asia until recently, um, land frontiers have been not completely, but relatively open. And also the degree of landlessness in Indonesia and in fact across Southeast Asia has been very much less than India, where British colonial forest boundaries were always more solid, China for other reasons. So basically, there is a larger story about closing of land frontiers and the consequence that, which is kind of written small in my study, but which is a larger process, which I actually examined kind of across the region in another book, The Powers of Exclusion, that I wrote to other people, which, looks, which takes a kind of a more panoptic area wide view of this same process. So, fourth meaning of Land's End is Land's End is a dead end. Uh, coming to the end of a peninsula without a raft, without a map, no pathway, no way out. And I use this image to counter modernization narratives which assume, sometimes too complacently, that there will be a way out, that there's some sort of a natural progression <laughs> from farm to factory, from country to city, as if the agrarian transition of Europe 
and in the, the transition which has occurred in some parts of Asia will sooner or later naturally occur everywhere else. And I was really struck by this phenomenon when I read the 2008 World Development Report on Agriculture written by the World Bank, which really repeated the 19th century agrarian transition narrative unrevised, as if one would expect this transition to occur in each and every country. But in, er in an era of globalization, why would you expect that? Like there may be manufacturing jobs being created in China, but they're of precious little use to you if you're being shoved off the land. In fact, this is so lazy, and yes, there is manufacturing, but it's not distributed in each and every country, and whole parts of the globe can actually be high and dry, you know, completely without this kind of transition, which the bank still presents as if it was a kind of a natural unfolding. So that's one of the challenges. So what I present, what I found, is that, you know, we are in an era of jobless growth in many parts of the world. Indonesia is one of them, India is another in which people may lose their land, but there's absolutely no guarantee that anyone anywhere will need their labor. Hence, people can be stranded, you know, at the dead end, with the end. Like, that's the other sense of land's end that I wrote to, to flag with this title. So, indigenous frontier is a part of the subtitle. I use this term to flag, first of all, that the people that I'm concerned with in this story are indigenous to the area, they're not migrants. And they have customary land use and tenure systems which are associated with indigenous people in much of Asia. Um, frontier, frontier here meaning uh, unruly, primitive, backward from the perspective of authorities, you know, the, the unclaimed, unruly frontier, but also frontier as in land of hope and potential. And I want to stress that it's the land of hope and potential for the Highlanders as well. Um, people in these kinds of highland areas, uh, frontier areas, often have quite an experimental attitude towards agriculture. They uh, adopt new crops, they try things out, in, with the expectation that eh, if it fails, like, there's always another piece of land over the next hill, the one after that. So have the consequences of an experimental attitude are quite different on a frontier, even for indigenous people than they are if you're in a kind of tight agrarian heartland where you know, to lose your land means you will never have land again. I mean, that wasn't their assumption as they started on this process. Finally, capitalist relations, that's the other part of the title. Um, so as I was searching for kind of theoretical lens, framework to make sense of what I found, I found the one provided by Marx indispensable, not just for the core questions, neatly summarized recently by Henry Bernstein, his questions are, who owns what, who does what, who gets what, and what do they do with surplus? And those seem to me like basic questions you would need to ask anywhere if you wanted to make sense of how people are living in this place and you know, why social relations take the form they do. But also, more than that, it seemed to me a lens for understanding what was really specific about the change which occurred here. Because it wasn't about people who are unfamiliar with markets or money, sort of suddenly encountering markets and money for the first time and being baffled by them. These people, like most indigenous Highlanders across Asia, have been familiar with markets and money for centuries, if not a millennium. Um, these people were producing tobacco for export in the 1820s. Like, these are not people who are new to markets or to money. They understand profit and loss, you know, those kinds of things are familiar to them. So what really shifted here wasn't that. I had to figure out why did things change so fast and so drastically. And market, non-market, money, not money is clearly not a sufficient lens to make sense of that. What we know is that Highlanders like this um, have been familiar with markets and they've also had consumer desires. We know this way back in history. You know, desire for prestige goods, for basic goods, salt, tools, clothing, none of this is new. But what we can well, what I would like to stress is that these kinds of market relations are not necessarily transformative. Indigenous Highlanders, like classic middle peasants in the various literature, have often had a stable mix of food and cash crops. They've been involved in markets. They've been able to balance uh, market engagement with attempts to limit both market and ecological risk. And there are many examples of that. So what I had to try to account for, for was why did the introduction of cocoa, in this case, have such massively transformative effects? Why did it change everything? 
Something specific changed here, not just the crop, but the character of Highlanders' relations to their land, to the market, and to each other. So to explore this shift, I found that attention to the specificity of capitalist relations was really the key, it's so indispensable. So the most useful framing for my purpose is the one supplied by uh, Robert Brenner and Helen Wood, who stress the switch from market as opportunity, you know, you may sell crops or labor, the price is right, you know, if you have a surplus, if you have a free day, your neighbor wants to employ you, sure, you know, I'll work for you for a day, but I don't have to, like, if the price is not right, if I busy with other things, I can continue on my own land. Um, so that's market as opportunity, taking advantage of an opportunity, and then the shift then is to market as compulsion. So clearly a landless person must sell their labor from day to day or starve. And it turns out that land short Highlanders are almost as constrained. So um, because if you have only a small area of land and it's not enough to produce enough food, your best hope of holding on to your tiny residual patch is actually to use it as efficiently and productive as possible and hope that you make enough money to buy food. What you can't afford to do is to use it inefficiently. Like if you insist on growing a few scraggly bits of cassava or corn among the weeds, you're guaranteed to lose your land because you will not be able to sustain yourself from that. You will have to take on debt and you will lose your land as a consequence. Right? So trying to account for how the market, the, the nature of people's relations to the market shifted from opportunity to compulsion turned out to be a key analytically um, supplied by thinking about capitalist relations and their specificity, um, and uh, at, at which the, in which the privatization of property, in this case the privatization of land, the closure of land is really an important element, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So the last time I want to introduce briefly is what I'm calling the analytic of conjuncture, a term I got from my geographer, from Doreen Massey. Um, you know, it, uh, but basically this idea that the way to make sense of this location was to embrace the specificity you know, of the time, the place, this set of people, this set of cultural, ecological, material relations that form it, and try to make sense of those. So I try to take its specificity as a, as a tool, not as a problem, which makes it just a case study, but actually every place is specific, right? Which doesn't mean that we cannot analyze it by teasing apart what were the elements that came together in this form, in this place, to produce this kind of transformation. So I like this approach because, first of all, it gets away from ideal types. If we have an ideal type of capitalism made in Europe, and this might be an example of it, it gives way to the question of what were the processes through which capitalist relations formed in this particular place. And secondly, it means that we don't have to bound our unit of analysis. So uh, by saying I'm only going to do like a local study or you know, in terms like that kind of disintegrate because you realize that the set of relations which form a place have different spatial entailments. Like something like the global price of cocoa, and that's a price set on a global market which resonates here and has particular effects. That's, you know, that's, a, that's a process with a long spatial tail. There are some which have very short spatial tails, like are you on the north slope or the south slope? You know, will it grow or will it not grow? You know, Will the pigs attack it or will it they? And it's very specific material things also a part of this conjuncture. And you don't have to decide, are you going to look at the local or the global? Because they're all in play. Once you know, you know what's the puzzle you're trying to uh, untangle, the processes you're trying to understand. So um, what I want to do now is to take you very briefly into place, just to give you, I think, just half to what I'm talking about. Uh, Indonesia, the archipelago the place I am talking about is here. The place that I wrote about in the world to improve is here. The same province, but a different area. Um, here we're zooming down. You can see incredibly rugged. Like just mountains right down to the sea. No plateau, no coastal plain. Just a very rugged landscape. And all this area, the light color is actually showing you this is all palm. Um, so here we are at the coast, um, very rudimentary fishing industry, coconuts, 
the economy on a very, very narrow coastal belt uh, planted in colonial times, um, coconuts straight into the hills. Here from the first row of hills looking back at the coast in an area where it's slightly wider, that's where coconuts you can see, um, and that's how it looks. Typical slash and burn type of agriculture, during the patch forest, planting this corn. Um, this was from the Sweden days, you can see the brown patches are the relative, oh, sorry, are the uh, recently cleared Sweden fields like this. This would be, you know, regrown from last year. Basically a fairly intensive Sweden system is what they were doing in 1990 when I first arrived. Um, there's a couple uh, planting shallots, which was one of the cash crops that was integrated in the Sweden system. Some girls preparing the shallots for the market. A guy carrying them, no roads, so shoulder carried. This guy's, these guys are, porters are paid by the kilos, so I watched him like lace one more bunch and one more bunch to max out his load. Um, Cocoa is the crop which is introduced. This is the kind of houses people were living in, as you can see, it's pretty basic. Um, clove was another crop which was introduced around the same time, 1990, when I started my study, but it was less popular because it takes at least eight years to begin to yield, and it only yields in alternate years, and so it was not popular unless you had a lot of land. Cocoa, on the other hand, starts to produce after two. Um, these are the kinds of houses people were living in, very basic, as you can see. These are the kinds of houses they would like to be living in. This is the kind of aspirational house of the highlands with plank walls and a tin roof. Uh, this is the kind of stuff people would like to have. Um, this is a house of the highlander who became a successful trader. This guy is Muslim. It's a mixture of Muslims and Christians up there. But the main thing is they're all part of the same ethnic group. They all speak the same language from the coast right up to the mountains. These are some Highlanders, same ethnic group, but people regard it as kind of more backward because they come from further inland. It's kind of a shift, you know, the further inland you go, the more backwoodsy you are seem to be. And these folks, because they've got their blowpipes, um, they're not Muslim, they are kind of a pig on their way down if they're lucky, cloth bundles. These are all kind of signs that when they go down to the market, the lowlanders would use to kind of mark them as pigs because backward people. Um, and these are a couple of Highlanders at the market looking at the world of goods you know, long hair, cloth bundles, kind of, you know, revealing their backwards status, really. wearing it. This is a coastal trader. Um, sorry, last picture. Um, roads just beginning to be driven up into the highlands, uh, uh, starting from 2006, but still not going more than one or two kilometers of land. So it's still basically uh, only accessible on the boat. Okay, so that's just to give you a kind of brief visual tour. So the questions then. Why did they plant cocoa? Like, why did they stop this whole transition? Um, the main reasons were that subsistence was not secure. So this is one of the kind of myths about indigenous people, Highlanders, Baptist people, so they live in some sort of stable environment. Um, but as many people have recognized, um, Sweden production is highly vulnerable to weather cycles, um, often fails. In this area, um, they are subject to catastrophic El Nino droughts. Um, every four to seven years, they had catastrophic droughts in which everything shriveled up and died. And these, for them, were terrifying periods because what are you going to do? You, know, you can't go borrow or you know find food from your neighbors. Everyone's in the same boat. Everyone's production collapses simultaneously. So they did not look back on the Sweden era as the era of kind of plenty and stability, but an era of erraticness. You know. You could have a great yield, and it was a happy birthday, day, and then you could have a catastrophe, which is panic stations. How are we going to manage? Um, so, subsistence not secure, um, in your droughts. Desire to overcome the stigma of poverty, which I've shown you, you know, ragged clothes, tiny houses, sense of wanting to join the march of progress was important. Um, especially vis-a-vis -vis the coastal folk, who treated the highlanders with disdain. Also a desire for schooling. This is a place that's unusual in, in Indonesia. Um, basically, there are no schools up there. And so the people are 100% illiterate, and they do not speak Indonesian, which is unusual in Indonesia. Um, so those were some of the reasons, right? They wanted to kind of get on the march of progress, basically. Desire for modernity, desire for inclusion. Um, how do they go about it? Well, starting with enclosure. Um, not enclosure as a project, because it was never debated as such, but effectively planting a perennial, planting a tree, 
crop, in this case cocoa, was understood to be enclosure in itself. So the apparently rather banal act of among, among your Sweden crops, this year's corn and cassava and rice, you claim to then plot into the future. And so I was there when that process started, and I saw every year there was tree seedlings going in alongside the corn. And I said, hey, gosh, if they keep this up, pretty soon this is going to be over. And, and it was, right? Basically, they pretty soon claimed all the land and effectively divided it up. What was interesting was that they, um, they had no, there was no defense of the concept of the commons. No one articulated the idea that, you know, we should preserve our customary or communal tenure. It's like, we got to find cocoa. That's the wave of the future. There was a cocoa boom going on right across the Boise at the time. They could see people were prospering from this crop. And they didn't, at the beginning, anticipate that land could come to an end. Right? They, they just saw it as a change of land use, which had these consequences of enclosure. But they couldn't imagine that this was going to result in complete exclusion of many people from any access to land. Why did they not defend a concept of the commons? I think because you know, if you're living in an area where land is abundant, you don't develop systems to manage it tightly. Why would you? You know, it, there's always more. And so this idea that indigenous people in frontier areas are going to be kind of like the arch communalists with very tight systems of customary management is kind of like a misfit with the environment, which is land abundant. And so, actually, their systems were very lightly articulated. And their main purpose of their customary land regime was not about rationing land. It was about recognizing labor, which was the, sh uh, the scarce factor of production in such an environment. So if you've invested labor in clearing a patch of forest, you're going to have rights to that land. And they didn't divide the land uh, in each generation. So the children used the father's cleared land rotation, added a bit more themselves, and so on down to the grandchildren. So over the generations, a kind of commons emerged in which, as they said, we all just borrowed from each other, and we went round and round like that, and that's how it was. Like that was as articulate as they got about the common sharing system. But it did, in effect, mean that everyone in the Highlands had access to land, until they didn't, until it was effectively closed. So that was the enclosure story, and I, you know, in the book I have a whole chapter about like what did they struggle over, and what did they take in their stride, and like how this actually took place. Um, but the next phase was accumulation. Again, in many uh, peasant regimes, you know, people have private property, but they hold on to it tightly. Like there's no way they're going to mortgage it or sell it. Um, so land, private land ownership, doesn't necessarily yield a cycle of accumulation, differentiation of the kind that I saw, polarization really. Um, so how did, why did that happen? That's what I had to figure out. Well, firstly, um, to some extent, initial capital. There were some people who had prospered from the previous regime, shallots and tobacco, and had funds which they were able to use to pay workers, like get more, basically a grab, you know, a mini grab from below at the early stages, get more cocoa into the ground. Quickly, they were able to set up their operations um, on a bigger scale. Scale turned out to be very important because you know you need to have a certain amount of land in order to generate enough money from your cocoa to feed both farm and family. Character of the crop is important. Cocoa is uh, they always said they say now it's a tricky crop because its entry costs are extremely low. It's a few seedlings and ground. But its maintenance costs are extremely high. It's massively disease prone. And so unless you're making enough money from your production to pour agricultural chemicals on your cocoa, it goes, the production goes down to zero by year seven. So you actually were obliged by the character of the crop to kind of think like a capitalist. You've got to think, how can I feed farm, feed family, you know, if possible, buy a bit more land so that children in future can also farm replace worn out groves, like this kind of accumulation was to some extent, you know, without taking that argument too far, um, related to the character of the crop. Um, also, uh, yeah, so then how did they, how did they handle this socially? And this was a remarkable process, right, a rapid period of differentiation, in which some people 
um, every year were buying out their neighbors. Like some neighbors, and these were, these were siblings and cousins. These are not strangers to each other. I watched as some families slid down. You know, each year went back, they sold a bit more, and they were just basically coming destitute, and others, their cousins, their neighbors, their siblings, were buying them out, right? So I could see this differentiation happening in front of my eyes, but that's a very awkward process socially. Like, how do you deal with, you know, your sister next door, whose children are hungry, saying, you know, give me a sack of rice, or lend me some money, and you know she has no prospect of repaying you. Like how, and, or even just the physical exclusion, like you may not plant your corn on my land because this is my land and I'm in the process of planting the cocoa there. Right? Like exclusion is very visceral and very direct because the people being excluded are your own kin. So how did they handle this? Um, why was there no pushback? Right? Why was there no counter movement on the land? You know? Why was there no pushback against this commodification? What of moral economies, shared poverty, subsistence guarantees, all the things that we've learned from the literature on Southeast Asia, you know, Jim Scott, especially Buritz also, you know, we've come to expect, where was this? First of all, capitalist relations really were compulsory. Somebody who did not run their family efficiently lost it. So people were obliged to restrict gifts and loans, or they would have no capital to invest in their farms, and they too would lose them. So understanding how the capitalist is also compelled, is also stuck now in the system in which you either act like a capitalist and preserve your capital, at least, if not make it grow, is not really an op it's not really a choice at this stage. We have to demote this liberal idea of choice. It doesn't really figure in this kind of set of relations. Why was it so tough? This is kind of an external factor, but most peasantries in most part of the world today are actually massively cushioned by state transfers and remittances. Many so-called small farmers actually are not viable, right? They are supported by flows of pensions, transfers, uh, remittances from people working elsewhere. So that if your farm is in the process of a slide, you get an injection of capital from some kid working somewhere else, and then you can buy back your land, pay off your debt. Like you can see how these external injections are actually crucial to what makes a lot of what are often characterized as autonomous, um, self-sufficient farmers are actually massively subsidized from the outside. So what was unusual here is almost kind of capitalism 101, like for an econ economics textbook. You had, you could say, a situation free of distortion. Um, you sink or swim in this competitive environment where you hold it or you lose it. And that's all there is to it, right? There's no external source of rescue. There's no external source that will support you. So that's unusual, but it is actually the essence of the capitalist system, which is supposed to be run on the basis of this kind of competitive relationship. In this case, that was really the case. So that's the second kind of, you know, this idea that these relations are really compulsory. Second, the old practices of sharing were not actually rejected, but they quietly fell into disuse. And this was a process I was able to track. Um, so where I saw the commodification of land as a critical turning point, kind of an intimate iteration of the great transformation that Polanyi described, they just saw a banal adjustment. It's like, well, of course, land can't circulate anymore. It's got cocoa trees on it. Like, what do you expect? Um, the whole system of labor sharing, which was part of the Sweden rice regime. Well, rice actually requires coordination. You've got to plant a whole field in one day because if you plant it unevenly, the birds will eat it all. So, you know, the, the, the logic of the crop actually requires a kind of a cooperation and coordination. They didn't abandon labor sharing because they stopped appreciating it, but they stopped planting rice. So the whole system just, you know, fell into disuse. Similarly, food sharing, um, corn, which was really their most important staple, <coughs> can only be uh, stored for a maximum of six months. They used to dry it and store it. But, um, so there was a logic in sharing. Like if you had a good harvest, you know, you're gonna be generous with friends and neighbors and you'll also sell some at a pretty really low price because you wanna kind of upload it. But the hope and expectations that this will in a loose kind of way be reciprocal. You know, when someone else has a bumper harvest, 
some more will come your way. So you could say there was a food sharing system, which I described in the book, although it was never <coughs> elaborated as we have a food sharing system, but you know, I could name it this, also disappeared because no one was growing any more corn. And if you're buying a sack of rice on credit from your cocoa trader at a very high price, it doesn't circulate in the same way. You know? So tracing how um, practices could be eroded, and I use this metaphor for erosion, I was thinking of like water on a stream bed. It's like over a period of time, certain pathways get worn down and become the obvious ones, and the pathways which were viable before, you know, the path is still there, but it's not traveled, and eventually, you know, no one goes down the path anymore, right? So it's, it's somehow trying to capture how, again, going back to Kalani, what one should see is this great transformation was actually understood in extremely prosaic terms as these are the adjustments one makes, you know, this is just how it went. And so I had to kind of wrestle with that, you know, with that sense that what I was seeing as momentous, they were taking in their stride. So how can I make sense of that? Um, okay, the third element of like how could this be managed socially um, was uh, what I would still go back to and continue to think of as kind of frontier thinking. Because, um, and this is the part where it's a bit disjointed, but um, you know, if you've grown up in an environment of a land abundance on the land frontier, it takes a while to get to grips with the idea that land has really come to an end, you know, that it is over. It's not just a question of not yet, but not ever. But what I found was people deferring that, saying, you know, one day I'll find a patch, patch of land and I too will prosper with cocoa like my neighbors have done. And it's true I'm a bit down on my luck now, but just wait and I'm going to get some money together. And I mean, the reality was that the people's um, source of funds, access to wage work, etc., was, was synthetic. With very low rates, rates of pay, very scarce work. Their capacity to accumulate enough money to buy land, which by that stage was circulating at a huge price. This was a completely unrealistic but it was their hope in the The other way people deferred the not ever idea was with reference to the unevenness of the landscape. So some people had 200 cocoa trees on a slope that's you know, really any day about to slide down into the river, but that was their cocoa farm. And they, that's the sense of pride in that I too am a farmer, I too have a future. And if I, this was the sort of state of play last time I was there in 2009 six years have passed, so it could be that that idea that I too will participate has gone, I don't want to go back to see about that. But certainly this idea, uh, the sort of the role of hope, rags to riches stories, um, you know, we're very familiar with that, we sell it here as well, right, this idea that anyone can make it to a sufficient industry initiative and so on. So, you know, these are familiar counterparts of what are effectively um, rigid systems, um, which, which hold up the promise of being open to mobility. Um, remarkably, there was really no nostalgia for the old days. You know, I expected that to emerge. You know, oh, look in the old days, we all took care of each other, and we each had food, and we shared land, and I never heard that. People still describe the old days as backbreaking work for limited and uh, uncertain returns. So their hope was still forward. It was like, you know, they look for the new boom crop, look for the new magic fix. Um, by the end, they had, some people had so little land, and you know, those who had no land were really stuck, but those who had very little land, they had this hope that some magical new crop would come along, that, you know, it would be like 200 square meters would be of such fantastically high value and would yield immediately, you know, some, some sort of magic fix which would get rescue them from their destitution, but um, no such thing as yet emerged. So, what does this all mean? To sum up, first of all, you know, what I'm calling an indigenous frontier, which we often think of as a very static kind of place backwardsy places where things don't change, um, in this case, had a very rapid and massive change. And in fact, Clifford Geertz also recognized this in his book, I don't know if you've read this book, but Agricultural Evolution, it was Java, it was the heartlands of the rice-producing uh, 
zone where things were relatively stable. But as soon as you went to the frontier and peripheral forest regions, in fact, crop booms have a long history. The colonial authorities noted these repeatedly throughout the 19th century, and they were alarmed by them because they thought that the peasants should just stick to food production. That would make, you know, enough food is what made people happy and contented and stable. And in fact, um, there were many stories in colonial archives of people going whole hog into rubber, whole hog into coffee. Like crop booms actually have a history in these kinds of frontier areas. So uh, this is actually not unique. And the role of desire, hope, ambition, experimentation, are always part of the equation, plus this idea, we've been poor for far too long. You know, these people have smeared at us for far too long. It's time that we, too, you know, became something. Um, secondly, indigenous institutions, customary land tenure, are not as solid as many advocates assume. Um, and as I've said before, why would they be a land abundant? So my sense of this, and I've written a paper about this that tries to look at this question comparatively, is that when we see kind of solid, protective institutions around commons, <coughs> it's quite likely, I think, and from my study I try to show this, that these are a response to capitalist relations. We've got the sequence backwards. So first you have a commons, and then you have private property. It's quite likely that you first have, you may have a loose kind of commons, but not a very solid one. Then you have private property and a shock about what can happen if you really let these processes rip. And then you have a counter movement which says actually we need to take control over our land, we need to start to protect certain areas, we need to hold things more, much more solidly in place than we ever had to even worry about before. We worried about land, there was always so much land. So I think um, the kind of historical sequence and what we expect indigenous land tenure systems to look like might need a second look in many cases. Um, also, the assumption of the stability of the so-called middle peasant, the idea that this is naturally given, that peasants will always know how to balance this stuff. Um, and you have to, then you have to make this into a historical question. Under what historical conditions can such a stability emerge? And under what conditions will the story that I found actually be the one you know, which, which takes over? So I think that has to be a kind of a historical and empirical question rather than something that we smuggle into our notions of what is an indigenous economy or what is a peasant economy, um, because it really is quite variable. In terms of ways out, um, the typical ways out are find new land, find a job. So in terms of land, um, this process, this kind of micro process that I'm uh, tracing here, coincided with a closing down of the forest frontier right across the province. And I've argued in the other book, Pals of Exclusion, right across the Southeast Asian region. So in this province, at the same time as this kind of micro process of kind of exclusion from below, was met by exclusion from above. You know, red programs, more solid monitoring of forest boundaries, conservation. Uh, Expansion of plantations, oil palm, uh, you know, other types of land uses and land users were basically buttoning down uh, land access, which had been relatively, not completely, but you know, relatively loose on the edges until now. So uh, when these folks tried to find a new place to farm, they were unsuccessful. And over the 20 years, I traced quite a few people who. You know, I went back one year and like they've gone, but okay, well they found a way out, and then I went back two years later and they were back. It's like it, you know, it failed exits were actually one of the stories that I was able to monitor. Um, jobs: only four percent of the labor force in this province is employed in manufacturing and mining combined. So um, precious few. And if you think about it, where are they going to go? You know, uh, there's no manufacturing to speak of really in Sulawesi. Um, they go to Java and they meet, you know, 100 million um, hungry Japanese. Um, they're going to be squeezed out of that labor market. And the idea of, you know, moving outside the borders, a lot of people place a lot of hope in migration. Um, but the, uh, the demographers estimate that Indonesia currently has about 40 million people unemployed. 
and the number of people in the diaspora is 4 million. So yes, it helps, but it can hardly be a solution, right? The ratio of people who make successful exits to those who must somehow survive where they are, uh, you know, it's not favorable. Um, of course, these kinds of people would be especially challenged because they don't even speak Indonesian, right? So they, they don't easily find their way onto, onto migration paths. Um, they certainly don't have those, you know, the skills, the money, the connections. But even if they did, I think there would still be the question of the jobs. Um, protection, support, surely needed. They can't fix this on their own. Um, I think that exaggerated myths of the Asian village, and especially the indigenous community with its assumptions of autonomy and solidarity, have played a powerful role in Indonesia and in other parts of Asia as kind of an alibi for not taking rural impoverishment and abandonment seriously. You know, it's as if you don't have to worry about them, because surely their family system, surely their communities will take care. But, you know, these kinds of conditions, that's not, that's not easily done. It's not at all obvious that one can just be complacent along those lines. Cash transfers, you know, the kinds of things which are going on in Brazil, in Mexico, in many other countries, you know, would be welcome. Um, very feeble so far, massive amounts of corruption, administrative incapacity, um, not in place. I think the question of traction arises. You know, these people were uh, massively isolated. So where are their allies? Who are their people? Who can they turn to? And when I presented this work, when a, a friend of mine from the NGO movement read the book, or the draft of the book, she said, well, where's the NGOs? Why are they there helping them? I said, you, you think there's an NGO in every village? Just because you only go to villages where there are NGOs. Like, you travel NGO paths. And so you see them everywhere. But I don't travel NGO paths. Absolutely not exclusively. And so I'm always in places where they've never heard of an NGO, right? And, and no such savior, you know, on the horizon. So um, that's a problem, you know, that, that, that's a, a, a misconnect. Um, but if one thinks about why NGOs are so absent here, you can see that these kinds of people would be massively unattractive for certain kinds of social movements. Right? From the point of view of the indigenous movement, the food sovereignty movement, like these people are a catastrophe disaster. They did everything wrong. Mm -hmm. They privatized their current land, they went for a global crop. Right? They, they are the kind of the alter ego of the iconic figure of the food sovereignty of the indigenous people. And so um, they really challenge movement assumptions and demands and force us to deal with a set of capitalist processes which it turns out can take hold even in unlikely places. Um, without anyone ever willing it to be so, right? And this is another part of this story. There was no outsider, there was no agribusiness, there was no state-run development scheme. You know, there's no villain here. There's no one to blame. And yet, this is what happened. So it's a very challenging study in that, from that point of view, from a movement perspective. The kinds of people who might be able to recognize this process, as one might say, is the Communist Party of old, right? Because they had an analysis of class formation. That was actually their repertoire, right? That was their language. They could have recognized these processes for what they were, but of course that party was decimated. You know, half a million to a million people were killed in 1965. Um, and there has been, despite um, nominally a period of reform, no replacement. There's no rural party, there's no peasant party, there's no populist party, none of the politicians or parties pays any attention to people like this, or has any analysis of their situation, or any remedy for it. So political parties are, are, are not there, they're not part of the equation. And none of these people have ever met a politician, um, or a journalist, or an NGO, or a social movement activist. So that's what I mean by no allies. But I think there's a reason for that, and it sort of comes back on us. Like, what are the expectations of these kinds of people? What makes them so uh, what makes that connection, what I called another writing, that kind of articulation, that you know, hooking on uh, so difficult in this, in this case? Um, because again, I, I don't think this is unusual. Um, these are people who can be abandoned with impunity. Um, how weird is this? Extreme, I think, but not exceptional. Um, rural people, rural populations in Southeast Asia are still increasing. 
I, despite the trend towards urbanization, a lot of um, Indonesia, uh, Southeast Asia now has about um, 40 million more people stuffed on the land now than it had in 1980. So although the proportion in cities is growing, and the proportion of GNP outside agriculture is growing, the net number of people on the land is still increasing. And these people are here, right? That this is an example of them. Like they're stuffed in these nooks and crannies, they're kind of holding on. In some cases, they're prospering. Often, they're not, right? They're stagnant, they're stuck. But they're not stagnant in the sense of things are not changing. And in fact, everything has radically shifted here, except the exit path, which is still lacking for them. So agrarian transitions have occurred in some places. I think Thailand would be one example. Malaysia would be another. It looks like it's happening in Vietnam. Um, so it's not as if that transition is, you know, we, we should never consider it, but we also cannot assume it as a kind of natural effect of the unfolding of processes. Um, land grabs, enclosures, these kinds of processes that I've described are also part of this scenario, and they make it harder and harder for people to hang on and live on the old terms, and yet the new terms have not really emerged for them. So one of my, um, so this is land's end, dead end, wit's end, um, one of my uh, joking titles I've given to this talk in the past is No Redemption or Why Everyone Will Hate This Book. <laughs> it really has to do with this idea that I think a lot of us um, as writers also are inclined to perform what I call the redemptive twist. Like, you know, you, you tell a dismal story, but you want it to, you want to have a happy ending, nevertheless, right? The people will rise up, or somebody to the rescue, or community triumphs. You know, we, we, we desire that kind of redemption. And I'm not going to provide it. I can't see it. I'm not just being obstinate. I don't see where it would come from in the present scenario. And so I think that's what I mean by saying like, this is a new political challenge. It's not, it's not a situation to which any of our available um, solutions is going to work. You know, it's, uh, they cannot be saved by the indigenous movement, by the so group sovereignty movement, they cannot be saved by fair trade, or, you know, one can think of corporate, you know, what, what, is, what is the current set of, you know, go-to solutions for dire rural conditions, and none of them are really going to support you. So, it's a very tough spot. Thank you for a really wonderful talk. I was really intrigued when you mentioned that you were viewing these transitions very differently than the people you were working yeah. with. And I wondered, did you ever mention to them your perspectives, or how did they react to your questions about these changes? Interesting. So I, you know, I did try, um, not quite being a kind of Gramscian <laughs> organic intellectual, but I did try to raise these topics. So one of the exercises <coughs> I did each time I went back was I sat down with questions years. I had from my earliest research a list of you know, lists of landholders. And so I would just go through and I say, still got it or not? Like I was just trying to do a sort of basic head count who sold, who bought, what was happening with land. And not just in the place that I talk about in detail in the book, but actually 10 sites to write books, which were my kind of check-in places. And so the picture which came out was some people were committing and other people were losing. And so I said, huh, that looks like this is the process that's happening here. What do you think about it? I see if I could raise this to consciousness. And they said, yeah, you're right. Some people are getting rich and some people are getting poor. That's how it is. Mm -hmm. like, I was not successful <laughs> in provoking a reflection on that of a kind which would have shifted the equation in any way. So it's not that I knew something they didn't. It's just that I considered it a turn, you know, momentous, whereas they didn't. And so, whereas I, I try to talk in the book about this kind of perspectival idea on conjuncture, and it, one of the concepts of conjuncture which I decided not to use in the end is this idea of conjuncture as a turning point. And the problem with that is that it's perspectival, right? What was for me the turning point was the privatization of land. What for them was the turning point was that land came to an end. Land's end was their title of the book, really. That was what 
they, that to them was what changed everything. It wasn't that, that, that some people came to own land, it's that it came to an end so they couldn't. So, you know, trying to get a sense of like, what are pe what's people's understanding, of what's the thing which has changed their world, means on the one hand you have your analysis, on the other hand you have to listen to theirs, trying to figure out what they think is changing. I, I'm trying to understand how you say there's no villain here or no impetus uh, for the beginning. It's, it would seem to me it's whoever started the trend toward cocoa, um, and it would either be you know the random planting or more likely the the buyers of the crop down the line. I mean somehow cocoa was the beginning of, of capitalist relations in this area. Uh, well, um, is that the villain? I mean, this kind of smallholder crop boom, like I said, has been going on since the 19th century. Rubber, coffee, sure, other iterations. Sure. And so the extent to which people spot a new market opportunity and jump in, you know, it's really, it's a long-standing pattern. So cocoa boomed right across the way uh, migrant farmers planted, indigenous farmers planted, as I'm showing you. Why Sulawesi in the 1980s and 90s? Basically, war in Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, um, and crop disease kind of created a space in the market which Sulawesi cocoa farmers were able to fill. So, is there a villain in that story? One could say that the global market for cocoa is as it was, it was always there, mm -hmm. but they were not yet attached to it. Um, you know, the people who first brought in cocoa seedlings, are they the villains? Not really. You know, this this uh, stuff is sold through Singapore on the global cocoa market. There isn't one buyer. It's not Nestle trying to kind of get everybody to plant cocoa. I mean, Nestle and the other cocoa um, or chocolate people are appalled by... Uh, I didn't mention the last part of the story, finale, is that almost all the cocoa is dead in Sulawesi now because it's been devastated by crop disease. Finally, the disease load is you know, overcome. And so what happens then is that the cocoa frontier moves off elsewhere. So the cocoa buyers are now, um, and in fact the Indonesian cocoa board, are trying to introduce cocoa into Kalimantan and Papua. Um, just to repeat the story, so cocoa is a frontier crop. The cocoa historian, Francois Ruff, has written about this because um, cocoa is always uh, most profitable when it's subsidized by what he calls the forest rent. Uh, when you can plant it in quote, virgin soil, um, you can get away for the first decade yeah. until a certain density is reached with no inputs to make a killing. And then it goes downhill from there. So, you know, co cocoa frontiers wane. And in Ghana and in Cote d'Ivoire, actually, and they've been planting cocoa for a long time, but it's always moving back into the forest. Yeah. Yes. So I'm, I'm curious on uh, Sulawesi, which, how large a geographic area of that island is included? <coughs> because I'm familiar with the Tanacharaja area. Yes. And that's, I mean, and that ethnic group is totally different and just yeah. not related at all to what you're talking about. So I'm kind of curious. About what portion would be involved with this kind of economy that we're talking about? Um, so at its peak, um, uh, I don't know how to how to give it a portion. I mean, uh, Indonesia became, I think, the world's second largest cocoa supplier. Something like 90% of it came from Sulawesi. Totally. So it was a massive boom, and now it's a total boom. Um, so it wasn't just a few isolated places. Now Tana Taraja is a bit different because it's terraced and it's rice producing. So although it's highlands, it's more like um, the rice uh, heartlands that gets described in Java. Elsewhere. That's how it behaves because um, the rice terraces are massive, sunk capital, they're family property, and those are the kinds of territories that people hold on to tightly. If they don't change hands in this way, you wouldn't have this kind of rapid polarization in a rice-intensive area. 
Entourage is also a little bit different in that it has um, you know, a different regime of accumulation. I mean, there's, there's various things which differentiate it. But if you were to go back a hundred years, uh, the Dutch were quite late in Taraja and in this era. I mean, in this era they, they were much later, but they came into town of Taraja really at the turn of the century, around 1900. It would have looked very much like this. Basically the same. Very different colonial history and a somewhat different kind of agrarian history as well. Uh, one of the how well, land ownership is, is, is a real issue with the Indonesian government, especially with these rice fields yeah. that are owned by 25 members of a family, and the government is trying very much to so figure out some way to get them together so they can sell off large plots of land to help industrial development. Now, I'm just wondering, to what extent the, is, is there any government involvement at all in, 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 in uh, your area? that is encouraging or discouraging this, these smaller chunks of property because it seems it's going in the opposite way of what the government really ultimately wants to do. Well, you may have noticed that the state is basically absent from the story. Yeah. Right? And it is absent. Okay. Yeah, basically, it's not there. You know, the, the, the way the territory is organized, um, you know, along the coastal strip, uh, uh, but, um, you know, that, that would be, say, a headman's house. Like, the headmen are every uh, few miles, there's a village center and a headman's house. And they have nominal jurisdiction over the highland interior, but many headmen, I discovered, have never been up there because you have to hike and there's no roads. And so, um, they, this is a very nominal relationship. Um, that people had. So these these uh, coastal areas had you know, a rather normal kind of village government system, but nominally that entire interior was under the sky's control, but he'd never been there. Like, so these, this whole area, you know, would be belonging to this guy. You know, this is his this territory, or maybe right into here. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? They they have no clue. Um, so so what was one of the interesting elements of the story is, and you know, one of the arguments is that property regimes require state backing. So what I found was that, in fact, the regime of private property emerged spontaneously from below, and largely because it was supported socially by the Highlanders. So you know, they effectively conceded to their own exclusion. Uh, I agree I can no longer plant my corn in your field, because that's now your field, and you've got your cocoa there, and I'm going to grow my cocoa here, right? I mean, that kind of, uh, not to say it was uh, seamless, there were struggles and there was arson, you know, the field of cocoa seedlings would go up in smoke because of some dispute over the privatization process. But on the whole, a decade later, that was settled down and this new regime of private property had taken hold and it was only supported by consensus. Now that's to say uh, a new customary regime had emerged which conceded to this form of exclusion as this is how we do things around here. So, um, and with no state intervention whatsoever. And these, uh, this buying and selling of land was paper free. It was basically based on, you know, agreement, something to the witness. Yes? So, uh, th th that's exactly the point I, I wanted to raise. Mm -hmm. So there's no cadastral survey. Absolutely not. Huh? <laughs> Silly question. So, so um, when land is bought and sold, yes. What exactly changes hands? Is there, is there a piece of paper? Is there a document? Is there a lawyer involved? No. So th this is a you know this is a customary regime. It was and and, and is still. That's to say, it's basically um, supported by the customs of the place, um, which recognise um, certain kinds of rights of exclusion. Right, your right to exclude me uh, from this. And this was done on a customary basis before, and it is now. Right? The, the, the terms have shifted, but it's still customary in the sense that it's supported and enforced by the Highlanders because they basically have agreed on what will constitute property. Um, so, uh, and I don't think this is that unusual either. You know that that customary property systems can work, including a massive like this, while still remaining customary in the 
sense that the jurisdiction, you know, who, who decides on infringement. So for example, after the enclosure process, if I was disgruntled and set fire to a field of cocoa seedlings and I was found out, um, the, the Highlanders would kind of assemble a little group of elders and they would find me, you know, for my uh, transgression. And the transgression is that the person's labor and capital that went into planting this field of cocoa, uh, you know, I had attempt to annul that land claim by annulling the cocoa, but basically I had infringed on their property right, which is basically the right of the labor investment in transforming a field of corn into a field of cocoa. And, and, the, and those principles would be largely agreed. So, uh, so it continued to be adjudicated locally. Uh, but, but you know, I, I, I'm... <laughs> Go ahead. It, I mean, it really is quite fascinating what you're saying. How this, how this was actually, how this happened, right? Yeah. You, you know, I mean, <laughs> what it suggests is that Marx is wrong, that it wasn't, that primitive accumulation was not written in the annals of blood and fire. Right? So you've got people, you know, that, that they're agreeing. So to what extent uh, is there an intermediary group? In other words, people who have land, right, don't have enough to live on. So you have a, a class of people who are, you know, they have some land, right, and therefore they feel, you know, they, they agree that private property is a good idea, but they can't survive on it, so they work for their wealthier neighbors, do you understand? I'm trying to see how this works politically, how, how it can yeah. possibly uh, be finesse. I think um, some of the studies of the enclosure of Britain, including E.P. Thompson's work, shows that in fact um, enclosure was not, and I think even Nick Bonley's work, it, it was not universally uh, opposed because many people hoped to claim a piece for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there were, you know, contexts in which there was, you know, mobilization against the principle and practice of enclosure, but there was a lot of um, conceding that these improving farmers, as they were called, you know, who wanted to have a more intensive form of land use were actually pretty much on the right lines, um, and that uh, that others wanted to join. And as, as E.P. Thompson says, it was only after a downturn in the market um, and people's inability to make ends meet based on their small enclosed plots that they really began to understand what they had given up in the comments, right? So, I think the kind of sequencing is also is part of the politics. It doesn't happen all at once, and it's not a decision. Like there was no point in which the Highlanders said, "We will enclose our land, we will divide it up according to these principles." It was every year a few more cocoa seedlings along the coast, right? And that was really how it happened. So if you're if you're interested in the, in the how, tap to read the book does kind of really try to look in more detail you know, at how. What was contested? What was conceded? When there were conflicts, when there was arson, you know, what was what was the play? Um, and you know, because it, it was a puzzle to me, you know. So I, I, I did try to unpack it. You can tell me if you're satisfied with the, with the answer or not. But um, but I don't think that we can see, uh, you know, with blood and fire. I mean, these processes can be micro. Right? Yeah, it's not just. I think this is this points to a process of enclosure from below, which is very challenging to that idea that enclosure is always a top down position. But that large scale is also going on in the same province. Right? Because there are large scale enclosures going on at the same time for plantations, conservation areas, at the same time as these processes from below. So it's all happening. And together they're producing this kind of pincer effect of land's end. You, know, you, you lose it locally at the same time as the frontier is closed by these larger scale processes. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Yeah, go ahead. Oh. Um, thank you. Um, I'm really having a hard time wrapping around the the loss of the moral economy between kinship, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm an anthropologist. So I was curious about actually rice subsidies too, and like, it, it seems like such a big deal to give up rice, but I guess maybe they're eating cassava and not rice. So, I, 
is there some kind of state subsidy for which to survive on, like whether there's like state subsidized rice or state subsidized cassava or anything like that? There are like how like what do you do with those excess million people who have relations with their relatives who then are not able to feed them? You know, like yeah, on a day to day basis, what does that look like? Uh, what happens is money. Like it's not no reduction. So, uh, although nominally there have been uh, rice in a basket programs, I don't know if you know much about Indonesia, but they never reach these people. And uh, because there's massive corruption which captured all the crops, these, these people are outside of the line. Um, so, whatever government systems nominally exist, they don't have access to. But the question of the moral economy, I guess you know, you're asking in a way a scalar question. On the one hand, do you switch from moral economy to state care or state yeah. subsidy. Um, that's extremely feeble in Indonesia. And I think there's historical political reasons why that's the case. Um, but moral economy among the people, like I said, they did not make a distinction between a moral economy of the past and an amoral one of the present, right? As far as, and I, I myself don't really, the problem with this like, concept of moral economy is like, when is it moral and when is it not? Like one could say that all of our economic transactions, including ours here, always have a moral component, right? None of us are perfectly generous, and none of us are totally mean either, right? We, you know, we continuously make judgments about how far to help people, how generous to be, you know, what resources to harbor for ourselves and our own families. Like these are everywhere standard dilemmas of economic life. Right, in the highlands, no less than anywhere else. So I don't think the moral and the non-moral is really what helps to untangle this. It's more what were the set of relations in which people engaged and how have those shifted so that the, the conundrums now are a bit different, right? So now a Highlander who was so one person I discussed in the book, you know, who became a money lender basically because he was very successful with his cocoa. And so all his relatives came to him asked to borrow money. So you might think, well, that's bad, he's become a money lender, like, isn't that the bad guy? But he said, well, they come to me and they say, you have money and you refuse to help, like, help us. So he was handing out loans and then some of his relatives thought that they didn't need to repay. Right? So he was losing his capital. And then at a certain point he said, I cannot get this right. You know, I cannot, they asked me to lend, you know, what am I supposed to do? So he said, I'm just going to stop lending. Then I can't be accused of extracting interest, I can't be, accused of chasing people for loans, and also they won't make a fool of me for just giving my money away for free. And so his solution was to withdraw from social relations, kind of isolate himself. And I stayed with him in 2006, and his house was extremely quiet. I, I had stayed with his mother in the 1990s, and then her house was a beehive, people coming and going, and neighbors, and food, and, and that here I had this kind of rather still, isolated little island. And so there's a history to that. Right? There's a set of relations involved in that. And his decision, you know, as a good person, trying to figure out how can I handle this? If I continue to give out loans on which I don't collect, soon I too will be destitute, you know? So that's, I think that's a better way, rather than seeing that the moral economy collapsed, is to see that the dilemmas with which people were faced shifted. And another one is like overemployment. Right? To what extent are you? obliged to employ your neighbors, or does every employment relation entangle you in a relationship in which your employees might want to make claims on you? And so some of the Highlanders who had the resources um, were very eager to switch from hiring people to clear the weeds to using a uh, herbicide which they could spray. And thought, well, you know, give your neighbors a job. You know, everyone needs work up here. Cocoa takes very little labor. That's the other part of the conundrum here, right? Um, it's not as if you lost your land and then you could work for your neighbors. Your neighbors didn't need you. But, and then even for the tasks for which they did need you, they were replacing you with a herbicide. And so why? And that people's explanation was, well, it's cheaper and it's more efficient. But it also meant that you could bypass claimants. You know, and so, you know, uh, Jim Scott talked about this in his uh, study of Sadaka, right? That as soon as patrons no longer needed to employ people, they stopped behaving like patrons. 
So this moral economy, you know, only was linked to requirement for labor. If you don't require labor, you actually can bypass people with whom your relationships become awkward. You know, so it's it's uh, it was that kind of shift that I was seeing, and you know, in which there again, it's not about villains and bad guys, right? It's trying to understand this as actually a capitalist milieu, which is what it had become. Yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm intrigued again by the concept of villains and non villains and you know, why yeah. it is that we, I guess, think in those terms with capitalism. Mm -hmm. Because it seems to me that the fact that this is arriving with a cocoa plant instead of with a gun or a company yeah. is like throwing everybody way off, right? And we're like, whoa, what happened? How can we have this when it's arriving with a plant instead, right? But it's still an articulation with yeah. global markets, clearly, mm -hmm. right? And so it seems like part of what this is kind of it's almost a reminder rather than being, it, 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 this is the, capitalism is social relations, it's not a person, right? And I, and I think that you got at that also with the idea that the, the capitalist, then in this case the local, is also disciplined to the market. And so it's, what seems, this just seems like a really great way of saying, Capitalism is set as a set of social relations that plays out in particular ways and disciplines people in particular ways where the, you know, the choices, as much as it's all about, it's supposed to be about choice, the choices actually narrow yeah. dramatically. Absolutely. And here it arrived with a cacao plant instead of with a yeah. company. <coughs> but it's still a set of social relations that play out in these ways. Thank you. I really, I mean, I like yeah. it. Rather, rather, rather than being like mystifying, yeah. I actually think it can be told in a way that demystifies. Yeah, uh, well, that's the hope, you know, that, that instead of seeing capitalism, well, I don't actually use the term capitalism. Right. Because an ism is like a thing, you know, which drives like a steamroller, <laughs> mowing right. it down, or it arrives in the back of a corporation. But capitalist relations takes us straight into the, well, what are, what is distinctive about capitalism? Well, it's that they depend on private property. They are compulsory, right? Everyone is caught up in them. Choice is eroded. That's the beast. Yeah. And how then do people survive? Right? So then we can go back to Henry's questions. Who owns what? Who does what? Who gets what? And what do they do with surplus, right? You can understand how on each of those elements, everything has transformed here in a way which was not the case when they were growing tobacco or shallots, because they integrated that into the swimming system. Mm -hmm. And so they still had collective land. And you could have a bad season with your tobacco or with your shallots. And you could farm again another day. Here, you know, you have a catastrophe with your cocoa, um, or you have a bad debt, and you have to sell it. Like, it's over. So if all the cocoa goes away, are they going to go back to planting tobacco well, so this is the question I right. was chatting with Max that? this morning. I was about sort of the post boom you know, because I, I, it just comes in at the end of the book. Because when I went back, the reason I went back in 2009 was because I read reports that a new disease called vascular streak dieback had come in, and this particular cocoa disease was killing the plants that way. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't something which just you know reduced output and so on. So, and, and in some parts of Sulawesi, the migrant cocoa farmers had just abandoned, they'd gone back to South Sulawesi so because the crop was dusty. They were like, I have to go back one more time. <laughs> I thought this book was done, but I have to go back and see what happened. So when I got there, in this highland area, vascular street streak died back, not yet arrived. But production was down by 70% over the year before. And so, uh, but the wild card, the global market price of which is pegged to the US dollar related to Europe, was up by 70%. So actually, people were still enthusiastic about cocoa, and their thing was to get as much into the ground as you can quickly to take advantage of the high price and the first rent. And so this, this, the effect was not to stop people, but in fact to encourage them to find any nook and cranny space and plant more cocoa. But over time, what the highlanders with more land were saying, we now know that cocoa is a very unpopular crop. So what we're going to do is we're going to gradually shift over to clove, and we'll, we'll plant cocoa for the initial yields. We know that in the long run it's a bit of a disaster, but by that time our cloves will be yielding, and because we have a lot of land, we can afford to wait. And so they were, they were not stopping. 
basically. And so this question of once land has been privatized, will it ever be communal again? You know, one could say it's a kind of a puzzle. I don't, I can't say I know the answer. You know, as I went back, I was trying to think of different scenarios. Like, would, would the end of COCO mean an opportunity for the landholders, land, people who have become landowners, to just like take it all? You know, buy out the struggling cocoa farmers with their scraggly, hopeless thoughts? Or would they decide that actually this whole highland farming thing is, you know, it's hard work and the answer, returns are very uncertain and now we've got a bit of money saved, we're going to go and, you know, buy a truck, you know, would, would they exit from the highlands? If they exited, could you imagine a scenario in which they would burn the whole lot down? It's all dead anyway. And what would happen next? Would the private property relations prevail and just the crop would change? Or would they actually recommunalize and say, you know what, we're going back to how it was, like we're all going to just plant food. Like I have, you know, I thought it's a kind of a thought experiment, um, as it was as I went back. What I found in 2009 was actually, it was the former scenario, that's to say the owners were taking it off. Um, but now, I don't know, you know, it's like, this is the problem with a long-term research project, when is it really over? <laughs> but it's really hard work to do this kind of build work, so I don't know how many times I will go back. Maybe I'll just... yes. uh, A question after Becky. Uh, I really like your work. It's uh, Economy 101, and I feel like it's a, a kind of a experimental field. Yes. And this reminds me about um, the capitalism begins. Uh, originally, it's also not like in Europe. It's not like a big collaboration from aliens coming to force people on Earth to do this transformation. It's pretty like here you know, they do it all by themselves. And this, I feel like um, this place, as you said, that in the past hundreds of years ago, people also like uh, participate in global trade, like any other crops. Maybe they haven't realized that maybe in the past is uh, I use metaphor is a, a physical transformation. Right now it's chemical transformation because the social structures inside of this community is really changed and they often feel like I can go some other places. They, they feel like I can go back, but after this chemical change, the social structures has changed and uh, connected to the, uh, capitalism, they cannot go back. They can also only go forward, either they become a, um, another commons or another um, uh, uh, first are uh, uh, involved in the capitalism. My question is, uh, thinking of the beginning of the global capitalism, it seems like whenever there is a opportunity for entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. always like entrepreneurs will do something so that to solve the problem temporarily, but make the social structures more involved into capitalism to a greater extent. But in this experimental field, I feel like you have no other like uh, corporations or big landowners. They are not really interested. Mm -hmm. And um, it, is that maybe because they speak a different language, or maybe because they're too far away, and people are relative to each other, and outsiders cannot <coughs> enter. But thinking of the global scale, long time ago, another country like mm -hmm. uh, the third world country, maybe also like this. But finally, like the some capital will come in and solve the problem temporarily, but uh, privatize and uh, commodify and marketize and make this third world country involved in the global division of labor in the long, long, long run. So my question is, um, in terms of this experimental uh, community, experimental field's future, is that uh, what we see past globally, we're likely to repeat in this Field. Okay. I mean that some outside yeah, will yeah. come and buy it all up or take yeah, it all over. Yeah. Well, I would not be so confident if that's a kind of an automatic reflex because there's other patches of land which are a bit more hospitable. As you saw, this is incredibly rugged territory. And so would an outsider bearer of capital choose this place to plant their money? Would they choose this crop and these people? Probably not. So outside capital that's coming down into, into Indonesia uh, and Indonesian capital is going into oil palm because um, it's a very lucrative crop. It's much less fussy than this, fantastically profitable. 
So that kind of uh, large scale grab is going on in Sulawesi as well. And in Kalimantan, we're currently studying all palm plantations. It's like the large scale iteration of what I've studied here on a kind of a peasant scale. Um, but there is, there is some movement here too, right? Basically, the, the uh, coastal traders who were part of the same ethnic group did not want to become landowners because uh, transaction costs were trying to. So, what they wanted, what they were doing, and they didn't do this at the beginning of the transition, the transition but later, they started to fund some of the landowners to expand more. Yeah. But that wasn't at the beginning of the process. So you're right that this kind of accumulation, it doesn't take place in isolation. But the first 15 years of it really were in isolation. The traders were not willing to advance production capital. Eventually, when they saw that half of the Highlanders were failing and were unreliable producers, mm. they thought, okay, well, then let's just make these productive guys. Like, why don't they take it all over? And then we'll have a steady supply of cocoa. We won't have to deal with these no-ho people who are always asking for advances and never bring us any cocoa. Mm. So they then uh, sped up, I would say, you know, this process of accumulation. Mm. So that, that's a part of the story. But it's not the whole story, right? The whole story includes this part which really was indigenous, kind of endogenous, it really did happen among the people for quite a long period before any external capital was interested. Maybe it's not like only capital, but <coughs> import not only capital itself, but import modes of production, import modes of uh, uh, like uh, ideas, technology, the way the production happens, the way social structure happens, the way. So that's why right. I don't see this as imported. So what was so remarkable was that they kind of invented it for themselves, right? No one told them this is what a capitalist should do or think. Like, these were the entailments of <coughs> the structure that emerged among them, and that's what's so interesting. Because it, 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 it sort of displaces this idea of capitalism as an alien ideology. It really wasn't like that. What was so remarkable was how it actually fit into their own notions uh, of, you know, return on labor and hard work and, you know, enterprise, which were indigenous ideas. Um, and, it, you know, like I said, rich get rich, poor get poor. Turns out that they were not so horrified by that either, you know. They had their own explanations for those guys getting poor or they're just lazy. They, they had, they started to come up with the kinds of organizations which are common here. So, and again, no one told them that. That was their own interpretation. It seems like comparative research will come here. Like, I think we'll like, stop, actually. We're, 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 we're a, a detailed yeah. conversation, and I think we have plenty of time during this. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank That's you. good. Do you have a reception in the lobby of Derby?